All right, welcome back to the Dr. Doug Show. Today, I'm going to go through my own Echolite REMS report. Now, I do have some success to show, so my bone is getting better, and I'm excited to demonstrate that. But one of the challenges we see with REMS reports is that when they are different than DEXA, people don't often know how to interpret them. And REMS also provides more information. So what I want to do is I want to review the REMS. I want to talk about my own story when it comes to bone health, and I want to try to answer some of the questions that many people have when they get a REM study and they don't know how to interpret the report. So stick with me if you've ever had a REMS, grab your report, let's go through it together. I'm going to show you mine, I'm going to show you my before and my after, and I'm going to talk about what I've done for my own bone health and where I think I can improve. So if you're not familiar with Echolite REMS, REMS is the alternative imaging pathway that I recommend for people if they have access to it. The biggest difference here is that DEXA is the gold standard. DEXA is a, an x-ray and it tells you bone density based off of x-ray. It doesn't tell you anything about bone quality for the most part. DEXA is, again, the gold standard. It's broadly available. Insurance pays for it in the U.S. and in other countries. It's included in the healthcare system. So we have to use DEXA. But we also know that DEXA has quite a bit of variability from test to test. So having another test that could help verify, especially if DEXA seems wonky, meaning like like there's a lot of disparity between spine and hip or some other weird things that can happen in DEXA, having another test can be really helpful. So the REMS, or Echo from the company Echolite, Echolite REMS, the REMS is an ultrasound that looks at both density and quality. And I'm going to walk you through what this report looks like. So when you get a REMS, you'll either get two body parts scanned or you'll get all three scanned. And when you get the report, the report will come in three separate documents generally, and there's going to be multiple pages. So I'm I'm going to walk through, and this is from December of 2022. So we're coming up on two years in December of this year since I had this initial scan. And so what you can see here is that if you look at this page where it says right femur, and for anybody listening to this on a podcast, I'm just going to walk you through it. But where it says a REM sensitometry, right femur, there's kind of a box on the left, box on the right. The box on the left has the bone mineral density T-score and age graph. So you see bone mineral density on the left, T-score on the right, age underneath. And so it'll put these two, two lines, this little crosshair, right where your age, I was 44 at the time, right where your age and your bone mineral density meet. And then that'll also give you a T-score depending on, again, your age. And so the T-score I have is a T-score of negative 1.4. So you can go down and look at that and say T-score negative 1.4. So by definition, you can see where it says diagnosis here, I have osteopenia. Now it also gives you a bone mineral density, BMD in grams per centimeter squared. And this is really important. So when it comes to comparing, we need to compare grams per centimeter squared number, not the T-score number. And I've talked about that before. And then underneath this blue box, we have this red box that says fracture risk assessment. And there's a really important takeaway here. So the fragility score is basically a metric that they can come up with from the database of scans that have been done. So thousands and thousands of scans have been done. They're comparing how the ultrasound waves bounce off of your bone compared to these, these thousands and thousands of scans that have been done. And it comes up with a fragility score that is out of 100. And this is better than if you've heard of TBS on DEXA, where there's really only three different numbers that you can get. The fragility score is going to give you out of 100, so it's a much broader range. And then you also get in this fracture risk assessment, the five-year risk of hip fracture. And this looks really concerning because it says four to eight, what looks like percent. I'm going to show you later in this report where that's not actually a percent. It's actually much lower than that, uh, but I'll explain how that all works out. Um, and then on the right side, you can see where the thing that they're reporting is uh, drawn out on the image, and they also give you some other numbers. So total hip is the thing listed here in trochanter bone mineral density, T-score and Z-scores are here. Let me just mention Z-score and T-score real quick. So we use T-score, which is a statistical analysis of your bone density compared to a sex and race matched young adult, so somebody with peak bone mass. The Z-score is adjusted for age. So this is your age match peers. And so you can see that these are generally going to be different. The younger you are, the more likely they're going to be the same. 
We use T-score for especially women post-menopause who are, and we're talking about osteoporosis diagnosis. We use Z-score for younger men and women because we want to compare to their age match peers. So it's a little bit of variation there. We see a lot of confusion around Z-score, but when we're talking about osteoporosis in general, we want to use T-score. All right, now on page two, you see the actual fragility score graph. So now you see fragility score on the left, age on the x-axis here. And you can see, again, little crosshairs where my fragility score is. And it says it's 13.6, which is great. So 13.6 is well in the green. And so my bone quality is very good. So despite the fact that I have osteopenia, my bone quality is very good. My risk of fracture should be low. But previously, I just said that it looks like it said 4 to 8%. So that's not good, right? So on page three, you have two more graphs. So this, is gonna, this top one is going to help you to determine your risk class. And then you use the risk class to determine your fracture risk. Okay, so let's talk about risk class first. So if you have osteopenia, so if you look on the, the top here, you see osteopenia, and then you go to your fragility score on the y-axis there, and you can see for me, I'm an R3. And I'll give you a couple of other examples here. If I had osteoporosis and low, low classification and on the fragility score in red, I would be an R7. Okay, so we'll use those two examples, R3 and R7 as we get down here to total fracture risk. So now you have this total fracture risk at five years calculation. And what you see here is R3 is highlighted because it's what my numbers show, and it's four to eight. But this is four to eight per 1,000 subjects per five years. So what they're really saying is it's four to eight fractures per 1,000 people per five years. That's not really percent. The percent would be if you wanted to do it out of 100, the percent would be 0.4 to 0.8. So less than a 1% chance of hip fracture according to their database, which would make sense for a 46-year-old guy. So that's often confused. And I understand why they report it that way. It's, it's right to report it that way. However, some people will come out of this and think, oh my gosh, 4 to 8% seems really big. Now this gets even worse when you look at R7. I'd say we'd look at both. So if you look at R7, you can see how it says greater than 50. Now, when I have patients that come back from a REMS and they say, I have a greater than 50% chance of having a hip fracture in the next five years, I say, slow your roll. You probably don't. Let's look at the data, and that's what they're saying is they're saying it's you know R7 greater than 50. Now, it's still not good because they have osteoporosis and a low classification on fragility score. However, it's not 50%. It's 5%, which is still more than I'd like to see, but it's better than 50. So please understand this total fracture risk at five years graph. All right, let's go to the next page. Okay, no scroll. All right, now on the last page, uh, it's going to give you some information about body composition. And what's cool about this is that it will actually, it's pretty darn accurate as far as body fat percentage, body weight, and uh, there's some other uh, numbers in here. Uh, now, this one, we didn't put in all the data, actually, because this was a, a scan that a, a friend of mine did for me. So they just didn't calculate all the data. But anyway, it, this should, would all normally be filled out. It did nicely say that I was overweight according to the BMI scale, though. We could talk about BMI another day. All right. And then the fifth page is simply just looking at the images themselves. They're documented on that page. So that's what this one looks like. So again, the summary is I have osteopenia, but pretty good bone quality. So now I'm going to flip to my femur and spine and show you what those started at. Okay, so here's my left femur. So similar, it looks like my left femur has a T-score of negative 1.3, still osteopenia. You can see the BMD there. And same fracture risk of 4 to 8 per 1,000 subjects at five years or 0.4 to 0.8%. And I'm going to flip to page two. All right, now on page two, you can see fragility score very similar, 13.4. So it looks, looks good. So let's take a look at my spine. All right, so here's my spine. Now my spine looks actually a little bit worse. So T-score negative 1.5. So my T-score is the worst in my spine compared to my two femurs. This all looks the same though. So everything is kind of listed out the same. It does list out the individual lumbar spines, bone mineral density, and T-score. So if anybody ever asks you about that, that is there. So let's look at my fragility score. So the fragility score on the graph here, you can see at 19.7. It's not bad. It's not great. So this might be a good time for me to tell you a little bit about my own bone history. So I was first scanned with a DEXA in my early 20s. So that should have been my peak bone mass, right? Well, I was raised in a household of highly processed food, and I don't 
fault my parents for this. They thought they were doing the right thing. They were on the bandwagon of avoiding dietary fat because they were concerned about my cholesterol, which is hereditary. And uh, so we ate a ultra low fat, ultra processed food household. I was born in the seventies and man, the snack well cookies and cakes and fat free ice cream and, and fat free frozen yogurt. It was like what I was raised on honey nut Cheerios and skim milk. So as a result of that, I did not eat a lot of protein, did not get a lot of dietary fat. I was pretty active kid. I certainly wasn't doing gymnastics, but I was running around and I was, you know, otherwise relatively active as a kid, struggled with weight and obesity. So there was some metabolic stuff going on out of the gate. But I think as a result of those dietary challenges, I never had good bone mass. So I never achieved good peak bone mass. And that was demonstrated by the DEXA in my early 20s, which looks very similar to this. In fact, it's about almost the same. I remember it. I have it somewhere. Uh, but I think my T-score in my spine was negative one five at the time. So that's real. All right. So now let's fast forward to last week. I did a repeat REMS with Dr. Kim Zambito at the Midwest Bone Health Summit. And we were able to catch up and she did a scan on me while we were doing so. So it's been not quite two years, a little shy of two years. And I will say this about my own bone health journey, which is I'm not particularly worried about fractures. So I don't do all the things that I talk about. I look at bone health for me as I do with my patients as they exit the program with improving bone is that I don't want it to get worse. I'd love for it to get a little bit better, but I am not working hard on my bone health. I'll put it that way. I'm doing some things. I have a power plate. I do not a ton of impact training. I do lift heavy weights and I eat a adequate protein diet like I talk about. I don't take supplements specifically for bone health. I'm not on testosterone. I'm not doing anything otherwise anabolic. So I'm not doing many of the things that if I had osteoporosis, I would do. But I would hope that with my health span approach that my bone would be improving. So let's see how I'm doing. So this is my right femur. So uh, T-score in uh, back in 2022 was negative 1.4. Here I am at negative 1.1. So that is a good improvement. But remember, if you're going to compare, you have to compare the BMD, not the T-score. Okay, so don't do the math on the T-score. Do the math on the BMD. So let me do that math for you. All right, so the math then would be 0.740, which is the BMD from my first score, the lower one, divided by 0.779, and that gives 0 0.9499. So that's a 5.1% increase in BMD. Does that make sense? So 5.1% increase in bone mineral density of my hip over the course of nearly two years. So is that significant? Yeah, probably. It just shows that the things that I've been doing are actually working, even though I'm not really focusing that much on it. Um, I am seeing improvement in my bone, especially my hips. That's good. But this is only one segment. So now let's look at everything else, right? So what else do we need to look at? Well, I want to know about fragility score. So you can see here, my fragility score, my hip is 14 out of 100. And I remember last time it was 13 something, right? So let's take a look and see where that is on the graph. All right. So now when I look at this, I see on the graph, it's, it says 14. It's still, you know, squarely in the middle on the green. So does that mean that I got worse if my fragility score went up? Well, maybe just a smidge, but you have to recognize too, that this line goes up, this green goes up as we age. So it might be that it stayed the same. And I just got two years older. Honestly, the difference between 13.4 and 14 is clinically probably irrelevant. Would I rather see it go down? Of course, but I'm not particularly worried about this from a clinical perspective unless we continue to see this consistently over and over again headed in the wrong direction. So not going to lose sleep over it now. Love to see it better, but don't think it's probably clinically that relevant. All right. So for my left femur, I was negative 1.3. Here I am at negative 1.1, not quite as good. And then my fragility score very similarly went from 13.4 to 14.1. Is that clinically relevant? Probably not. So is this hit better? Yeah, probably. Maybe not quite as much, uh, but still headed in the right direction, right? So let's look at the spine. All right. Now when we look at my spine, you can see again, the bone marrow density got better. But if you look over here on the right, you can see, okay, we've got three yellow vertebrae and then a gray vertebrae. What does that mean? Well, it means that this second vertebrae, this L2, was not red. It wasn't red because she didn't try. It they wouldn't pick up data. And that could have been because I had something obscuring that in my bowel. It could have been for any number of reasons. But ultimately, we don't have the data. So what do we do? Well, we need to look at the other vertebrae and say, well, how do they look? And you can see everywhere from negative 17 and negative 11, whereas before on the spine, they were negative 14, 16, 14, 16. So 
I would say overall, these look better. You know, is it, you know, this negative one seven at L1? Is that concerning? You know, maybe, but overall they're looking better. And, you know, the areas where we're more likely to have issues are the bigger vertebrae. So I would say we are probably headed in the right direction. T-score overall is headed in the right direction, but this is certainly something that I would want to watch. I'm loading my spine quite a bit, so I think probably we're doing okay here. Now, the fragility score at 20.3 puts me at a five-year risk of major osteoporotic fracture at 10 to 20 per 1,000, which is actually 1 to 2%, right? So this isn't nothing. This isn't totally benign, uh, but this is something to say, well, okay, we just need to continue to work on the spine and make sure this is headed in the right direction. Let's look at the fragility score, though. All right, so now in the spine, we have a fragility score of 20.3. Now, my previous fragility score was 19.7. But again, remember, this is going to increase. The green's going to increase over time. So this is probably just consistent with this line going up. Clinically, is it 19.7 to 20.3? Is that really significant? Not really. So I'm not particularly worried about this increase in fragility score, but I would love for it to get better. So now I probably have some increased motivation to actually do more of the things that we're talking about. So... This has, I hope, been a helpful review of a REMS scan. Um, Never gone through it in all that much detail before. I think the REMS, again, is a very powerful, uh, definitely secondary tool, if not primary tool. And there's a lot of research going on right now on REMS. There's a big uplift um, in the, uh, you know, the corporate side of Echolite and all the companies that are coming together to try to bring this uh, on a much bigger scale to people with osteoporosis. So uh, look for REMS around. If you're a member of the Osteo Collective, we have a growing list, and we try to keep that updated. Um, and that's a good way to find uh, data about REMS and where to go to get a REMS. Um, we're also working on creating content on helping people to understand the REMS. But in the meantime, if you have questions about osteoporosis, um, you kind of have two choices. So one is you could come to our master class. Our master class is totally free. We talk about the myths and misconceptions around osteoporosis, and it's a really valuable tool if you haven't gone through it. If you've gone through it, or if you're looking for more of a community, consider joining our Osteo Collective. Osteo Collective is our bone health community of hundreds, uh, almost thousands now of people who are uh, improving bone health in a DIY fashion. Um, some really incredible resources in there. We do a weekly uh, topic-driven Q&A Zoom call uh, with myself or a team member. We have a content vault. We have discounts on products and services at a a greater level than we have available here on YouTube. So it's a really, really great resource. If you are interested in community, definitely would encourage you to join that. Links for both of those things are in the description on YouTube, or you can go to our website, optimalhumanhealth.com, if you are listening to this on a podcast. So remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis is not the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you on the next video.